Father, we thank you for this time where we can congregate in your name and worship you in our thoughts and with our hearts. We pray that this message will be one that will have a long-lasting impact that will be a means in which you use to encourage, to equip, and to strengthen your church and your believers. Thank you for this opportunity to glorify you in my speak, only what you desire me to speak. And may they be fruitful, not in vain. Amen. I spent quite a, some time thinking what exactly I wanted to share this week. So I don't know exactly what you were expecting. I think it's important when each of the men gets up and speak that we don't have an expectation in that person. We cannot bamboozle you with the word. We're just a means that God uses. You know, we are weak and we are but worms. We're helpless and I recognize my weaknesses. And one thing that upsets me greatly is when people approach me and they, and it means to encourage me, they discourage me because they claim how I spoke was with eloquence or they swooned in the presence of the preaching when that's not, that's not the objective of preaching at all. You know, when I want people to approach me and say, don't we serve a wonderful savior? You know, I think it was, it was Confucius who said, the fool, the fool looks at the finger when a man points at the moon. Mm-hmm. No, I, I'm pointing to Christ and I'm, I'm hoping that you see the wonders in the word. And it's not just here, it's everywhere you go. We, we venerate men. We venerate preachers and pastors and people who handle the word of God and rightly divide it. But they're but men. And but by the grace of God, they reprobate. They're fools. If any man thinks he's anything, then he is nothing. If any man thinks he knows anything, he knows nothing as he ought to know. So, the message I am bring today might seem quite primitive. I'm going to read the word of God. And let the word of God minister to you alone. So, I'm not going to stand here and the wisdom of men. I'm going to preach the word of God. But I want to have an outline. I have three points. One I want to briefly talk about before we get into the word of God. The sufficiency of scripture. And since the scripture is sufficient, men are inadequate. I'll be covering that. Then I will briefly go into hermeneutics. I think it's important that we understand how to read the word of God, to rightly divide the word of truth, and I'll briefly be going into that. I'll be talking about some large terms. Don't feel you have to write them down. I'll give my notes to anybody who wants. I prefer if you just listened. And then we'll be reading Colossians, and I'll be reading four chapters straight through without stopping. I think we need to have a hunger for God's word in this place more than a hunger for preaching. I read a book a while back by David Platt, it was called Radical, and he was talking about how he went to a village, and it was in the country where Christians were persecuted, and how he was terrified entering this village because they had to hide him under a blanket, and all, anything he brought was his Bible, and they had to bring him in during the night so no one could see him. And he, they snuck into this, this small room, it was tiny, it was packed with people and it was putrid and it was, everyone was sweating and it stunk. And there, was only, there was only one light bulb that lit the whole place. And there was only one Bible, the Bible he brought because Bibles were banned in this particular country. And he began talking about Genesis and how God's redemptive plan was through Genesis. And everyone listened was taking notes vigorously. And then they said, well, continue after he had finished. So then he went through Exodus. And he went through Leviticus, the Numbers, and Deuteronomy, and he went through the whole Bible. He said he, said he was there for eight hours, or over eight hours, 
preaching the word of God. And they all loved it. They all stayed there and were diligent. And I think we should have a type of attitude when it comes to God's word that we're prepared to stay here as long as it takes it until God has given us what he wants to give us. Psalm 84 says, For a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. One day here at church and reading God's word is better than a thousand elsewhere. You have nothing better to be doing than to be here opening God's word. So let's talk about the sufficiency of scripture and the inadequacy of man. 1 Timothy 2, verses 5-7 to says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Jesus Christ, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time, for which I was appointed, so Paul was appointed a preacher and an apostle. I am speaking the truth in Christ and not lying, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. There is one mediator between God and man. It's Jesus Christ. I'm not your mediator. If you're, if you're relying on the sermon being brought here each week, it's not, it won't satisfy you. We're men. Christ is your media. And this, I constantly talk to people. I say, test what I'm saying. I'm just a man. I could be lying to you for all you know. You've got to test it with God's word. I'm not needed. I'm not necessary. God does not need me here today to preach the gospel. His word is sufficient. 1 John 2.27 says, But the anointing which you have received from him abides in you. If you're born again, the anointing abides in you. And you do not need that anyone teach you. You don't need that I teach you. But as the same anointing teaches you concerning all things, and is true, and is not a lie, and just as it has taught you, will abide in him. God, God's anointing will teach you. His spirit will teach you. I'm not necessary. John 8, 31, 32 says, Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. He's talking later in the context, he's talking about a spiritual freedom, because they said that we're not in bondage to anyone, being children of Abraham. He said the soul which sins is the slave of sin. So if you're not satisfied with God's word, then you're not satisfied with Christ. That's very important. If you're not satisfied with God's word alone, you're not satisfied with Christ. Because John opens up his gospel and the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. So if this cannot satisfy you alone, then you're not satisfied with Christ. Christ isn't enough. So I briefly want to talk about hermeneutics before we get into Colossians. It's important when we read Colossians, which is the letter sent to Colossae, it was meant to be read all the way through. The chapter divisions are deceptive because we have a tendency to be chapter by chapter when we, they should be read all the way through. It's important you do that with the book of James, with Romans. Even though Romans is quite longer, it's important that you read it all the way through so you understand the train of thought. So hermeneutics is simply the science of interpretation. The hermeneutic that we apply to the scripture is called a literal hermeneutic. is the historical grammatical, which is not to be confused with a literalistic Interpretation, which is the word-for-word -word interpretation, does not take into account of metaphor, context, so forth. And many people think that's what you mean when you say, well, I interpret the Bible literally, but you, you interpret with a historical grammatical interpretation, which you understand the context and the, 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 the setting in which it was, was laid out. And throughout Scripture, there's the principle of harmonization, which is that Scripture interprets Scripture. And you're, you're reading Colossians that the principle of harmonization will be able to apply to different parts of the Bible. That's all harmonious. Uh, there's no contradiction. And this is important if you're understanding things that you re reference other parts of the scripture so you have a balanced view, you interpret it as a whole. These are the three aspects of hermeneutics, which is to identify the situation being addressed. So number one is to identify the situation being addressed. Who was it written to? Who they, what are they addressing? That's, that's important. So that Interpret in terms of a whole, as in the whole text, and not just as the book of James itself, or, or Colossians in this case, but as in the whole scripture itself, the whole canon. Scripture can, and this is the most important, scripture can only be interpreted correctly through the Holy Spirit. And Lee gave a, a testimony today how those, those boys they were talking to were, were blinded by the truth. It's because the Holy Spirit alone enables us to understand the scriptures. And we see this in Luke 24, 45, when Jesus showed himself to his disciples. 
And this, he said, then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. Christ had to open their minds that they understand the scriptures. And these were believers. These were disciples who walked with Jesus. And he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. Psalm 119, 18 says, Open my eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of your law. 1 Corinthians 2, 9, 16. This is what Paul says. What no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of a man imagined, that God has prepared for those who love him. These things God has revealed to us through his Spirit. For the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For who knows the person's thought, except the Spirit of that person which is in him. So also no one comprehends the thoughts of God, except the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given us by God, that we impart this in words, not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him, and he is unable to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. The spiritual person judges all things, but it is himself to be judged by no one. For who has understood the mind of the Lord as to instruct them, but we have the mind of Christ. God's Spirit dwells within you, and He's the anointing which helps you to interpret the Scriptures. He opened their minds to understand the Scriptures. So that's the importance of hermeneutics and the inadequacy of man when approaching the Scriptures. I'm going to read Colossians simply because Colossians tells you to read Colossians in an assembly. At the end of it, Colossians 4, 16 says, And when this letter has been read among you, have it also read in the church of Laodicea and see that you also read the letter from Laodicea. It tells us to read it in this congregation. This, the book of, this letter of Colossians would have been read in the congregation. Therefore, we should read it. Even though it wasn't written to us, we should still read it. So let's understand the audience is to the church in Colossae, which is in Asia Minor. It was written approximately 60 AD. This is when Paul would have been in prison. So he's in prison and he's writing to Gentiles, which he has not met. So that's the context of this letter. So I encourage you to follow along as I read through this and take down notes on things that stick out to you that you want to come back to and we can discuss it afterwards if you like and I'll tell you how I systematize or break down books of the Bible because it's important that we understand the key themes and concepts that are being presented in the letters and this, this is one thing that really convicted me that I knew more things about my culture than I did about the scriptures Someone could have asked me, what's your favorite TV show? And I could tell them all the characters in this TV show, the personalities of the, the actors in the TV show. I could tell them about specific episodes. I could go on and on and on for hours. But if they asked me, well, tell me about the book of Colossians, I'd be stumped. I don't know what the key themes in Colossians is. I don't know who he's writing to. I don't know what the, the setting, the background of it. And that's, I hope that pricks your heart that we have a tendency to care more about our culture than about our scriptures. Right, Colossians, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ who are in Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of your love for all the saints, because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, of which you heard before in the word of truth and of the gospel, which has come to you, and it has also in all the world, and is bringing forth fruit, as it is also among you since the day you heard and knew the grace of God in truth. As you also learned from Ephraim, a dear fellow servant who is faithful, minister of God on your behalf, he also declared to us your love in the Spirit, for this reason we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. 
that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power for all patience and long suffering with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of his love, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created, that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. And he is the head of the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell, and by him to reconcile all things to himself, by him whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. And you who once were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, he now he has reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. If indeed you continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast, and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you heard, which was preached to every creature under heaven, of which I, Paul, became a minister. I now rejoice in my sufferings for you, and fill up in my flesh what is lacking in your afflictions of Christ for the sake of his body, which is the church, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God, which was given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. The mystery which has been hidden from ages and from generations, but now has been revealed to his saints. To them God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of his mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Him we preach, warning every man and teaching every man all wisdom, that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. To this end I also labor, striving according to his working, which works in me mightily. For I want you to know that a great conflict I have for you and those in Laodicea, and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love, and attain to all riches of the full assurance of understanding, to the knowledge of the mystery of God, both of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Now this I say, lest anyone should deceive you with persuasive words, for though I am absent in the flesh, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. Beware, lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit, according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ." For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him, who is the head of all principality and power. In him you were also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, in which you also were raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. And you being dead in your trespasses and uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that are against us, which was contrary to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. Having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it, so that no one judge you in food or in drink or regarding a festival or new moon or Sabbaths, which are a shadow of things to come, but the substance is of Christ. Let no one cheat you of your reward, taking delight in false humility and worship of angels, intruding in those things which he has not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind, and not holding fast to the head from whom all the body nourished and knit together by joints and ligaments grows with the increase that is from God. Therefore, if you died with Christ from the basic principles of the world, why as though living in the world do you subject yourselves to regulations? Do not touch, do not taste, do not handle, which all concern things which perish with the using according to the commandments and doctrines of men. 
These things indeed have an appearance of wisdom in self-imposed religion, false humility, and neglect of the body, but are of no value against the indulgence of the flesh. If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things of the earth, for you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Therefore put to death your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desires, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience, in which you yourself once walked when you lived in them. Now you yourselves are to put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. Do not lie to one another, since you have put off the old man with his deeds, and you have put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. Where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave nor free, but Christ is all and in all. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, you also must do. But above all things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatever you do in word or deed, do all to the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting to the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be bitter towards them. Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children, lest they become discouraged. Bond servants, obey in all things your master according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in sincerity of heart, fearing God. Whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance for you serve the Lord Christ. But he who does wrong will be repaid for what he has done, and there is no partiality. Masters, give your bond servants what is just and fair, and that you also have a master in heaven. Continue earnestly in prayer, being vigilant, in it with thanksgiving. Meanwhile, praying also for us, that God would open to us a door for the word, to speak the mystery of Christ, for which I am also in chains, that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. Walk in wisdom towards those who are outside, redeeming the time. Let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer each one. Tychus, his beloved brother, faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord, will tell you all the news about me. I am sending him to you for this very purpose, that he may know your circumstances and comfort your hearts. With Ernius, a faithful and beloved brother, who is one of you, they will make known to you all things which are happening here. Osterus, my fellow prisoner, greets you with Mark, the cousin of Barabbas, about whom, whom you receive instructions. If he comes to you, welcome him. And Jesus, who is called Justice, these are my fellow workers for the kingdom of God, who are of the circumcision. They have proved to be a comfort to me. Ephraim, who is one of you, a bondservant of Christ, greets you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers, that you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. For I bear him witness that he has great zeal for you. And those who are in Laodicea and those in Heropolis, Luke the beloved physician and Demas greet you. Greet the brethren who are in Laodicea and Nymphos and the church that is in his house. Now when this epistle is read among you, see that it is read also in the church of the Laodiceans and you likewise read the epistle from Laodicea. And say to Archippus, Take heed to the ministry which you have received in the Lord, that you may fulfill it. The salutation by my own hand, Paul, remember my change. Grace be with you. Amen. So reading, reading that, what is the key word you, you think keeps on sticking out? What's the predominant theme? He's repeating something over and over again. 
Maybe you can't get on the first reading, but it's, it's good to break it down verse by verse and go through it. I'll, I've gone through it here very briefly. You're welcome to get these notes off me. And to test, test them. And I encourage you to do this with other books of the Bible when you study them yourself. Go through them verse by verse and paraphrase in your own words what he's talking about. So when you read over your own notes, you have a better understanding of the train of thought that Paul is trying to communicate. Because you're trying to get your, your minds in sync with the mind of the author. So from chapter 1, verses 1 to 10, Paul prays for the saints, which is verses 3 to 4, to be filled with knowledge and spiritual understanding, to be fruitful and pleasing, because they have hope in Christ. And that's the reoccurring theme throughout this letter that keeps on coming up, this idea of having spiritual understanding, spiritual wisdom, having knowledge to then apply it to bear fruit. And he talks about, from verses 12 to 24, God ordains, he qualifies. All things exist for him, you also see this in Romans 11, 34, and 36, where, you know, of him and to him and through him are all things. So we have this principle of harmonization being carried out throughout Scripture that's reconfirmed. And also in Proverbs 16, 4, it says, He's created the wicked for the day of doom. All things are created for him and by him. And in him all things consist. And this is, this is also seen in Hebrews 1, 3, when, when Lee gave his message he talked about how in Hebrews 1 3 all things consist by the power of his word so all things consist for God and by God and he's the head of the church and he has reconciled you and you can be blameless in his sight if you are faithful the, the key word here is blameless in his sight if you are faithful it's not, he's not talking about salvation he's not saying well if you're unfaithful you, you know you could lose your salvation because we need to apply the the principle of harmonization and if you read in 2 Timothy 2, 11 to 13 you can actually flick there it's just so I read this again so you can un understand it and you who were once alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works yet now he has reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in the sight if indeed you continue in the faith grounded steadfast and, are moved, and not moved away from the hope of the gospel if we read in, in Timothy 2.11 to 13, this is the faithful saying, for if we died with him, we shall also live with him. So if you've died with him, if you're born again, regenerate, you will live with him. For this is the faithful saying, if we died with him, we also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. Not all Christians will reign with Christ. Only those who endure, is conditioned upon enduring. If we deny him, he will also deny us. And Jesus even said that as the principle of harmonization again. He said, those who confess me before men, I'll confess before my Father. If we are faithless, he will remain faithful because he cannot deny himself. Christ can deny you, but he can't deny himself. So that's important to keep in mind. When you read scriptures like this, we need to read it as a whole of the body of text, the whole of scripture. And understand that he's also writing to Gentiles. Okay, then Paul suffers knowing he labors not in vain because Christ carries his church. And from verses 25 to 28, God has made known the mystery of salvation, our hope of glory in Christ. And this is why we warn every man to present by teaching and wisdom. So this the idea of presenting wisdom and knowledge and teaching men and warning every man of the wrath that is to come. Chapter 2, encouraged through the understanding of the mystery of Christ to be assured, being held together in love. So the same theme of Understanding is again being reiterated. And Christ being all knowledge, preventing deception through philosophy. So he's saying that all knowledge belongs to Christ. He's saying that God holds all things together. All things were created by him and for him and through him and to him. Therefore, if someone is to present a logical argument or some philosophy against you, it has to presuppose Jesus Christ. It has to start with Christ because those things can only exist in Christ. So don't, don't be beguiled by these philosophies which have to use the necessary things which can only be justified in Christianity to argue against Christianity. Don't be beguiled by persuasive argument. Then from verses 11 to 16 in chapter 2, circumcised in Christ. So these were obviously Gentiles who were not circumcised. 
So this was probably an issue for them. Should we be circumcised? He said, you are circumcised in Christ and you've forgiven all your trespasses. Christ took the penalty of the law on himself, making a public spectacle of the principalities and powers and triumphing over them by disarming them. Let no one judge you as Christ has conquered and fulfilled the law. As we see in Romans 8 as well, 31, 39, who can bring a charge against God's elect? Who can bring a charge against God's elect? It's, It's important that we don't bring a charge against ourselves because we have been forgiven in Christ. 18 to 32 says this so that you are not cheated of your reward. So your, your reward can be cheated. He's, he's, Paul has written this so that you will not be cheated of your reward. You can have your reward cheated from you. And it's, it's important that you understand what the Bible says so that does not happen. That's why he keeps on reiterating this, the importance of understanding the scriptures, understanding what God has revealed, that the revelation comes from God and Him alone. He talks about Christ as the nourishment, the principle of harmonization, scripture interprets scripture. John 15, Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you do not abide in me, you will not produce fruit. You can do nothing unless you abide in me. Christ is the nourishment. Don't submit self to commandments of men which serves no value to the indulgence of the flesh. We're not, we're not justified by the commandments. They serve no value to the indulgence of, of the flesh. Then from chapters 3, verses 1 to 11, put on Christ, set your mind on things above. You know, putting on Christ is a recurring theme throughout the Bible. We even read yesterday in Ephesians 5, it put on the armor of God, put on Christ. And this idea of binding your thoughts captive to the obedience of Christ, setting your affections on things above, is also reiterated in Peter 1, verses 13. Bind up the loins of your mind. Yeah. And the carnal mind's at enmity with God. Bring every thought captive onto the obedience of Christ. It's the whole reoccurring theme of loving God with your mind and understanding the scriptures, but also having your affections on things above, not on things of the earth. Put on love, the bond of perfection. Well, we've really discovered what love is. Christ is love. Put on love, which is Christ, and he's the bond of perfection. Be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Do everything for Christ in thanks. So have, have humility. Be thankful. Dwell richly in God's word. Understand his word. He talks about from three, and this is important why you read it all the way through because we have an overlap of his thought from the working out of chapter 3 from verses 18 to 4 to verses 6. There's an overlap in the scriptures and he talks about the working out of this is wives will submit to husbands. Husbands will love their wives and will not be bitter. Children must obey their parents. Servants will work not unto God but unto man. And masters will be just and fair. That will be the working out. When you understand this, there will be fruit. When you understand these spiritual understandings, there will be fruit. And then chapter 4, he concludes with to continue in prayer and thanksgiving. So he's reiterating, re- re- reiterating themes. To pray for the harvest, to pray for doors to be opened that he may preach the gospel, the mystery of Christ and boldness. To walk in wisdom with speech, with seasoned speech, with salt and grace. And Jesus said, what if the soul loses the saltiness? It's to be trampled on by the foot of men. It's worthless. So our speech needs to have salt and light and needs to be filled with grace as well. And to be a comfort to one another. And that is the fulfillment of the Lord, to love one another. There should be fruit. So not just be hearers of the word, but doers of the word. And these are reoccurring themes that are constantly throughout the Bible. So that's, if you break down a letter like that, systematically, you can have a better understanding of the, the general thoughts. So if someone asks you, what's Colossians about? You can now say, well, it's about spiritual understanding that we are secure in Christ alone, not justified by the Lord, that the, the knowledge of Christ will lead to fruit and if it doesn't lead to fruit we, we have the possibility of losing a reward and that's what Colossians is about so I just want to close in prayer Lord I thank you for your word I thank you that we can understand your scriptures through your Holy Spirit that you've that you can open our understanding that these things are comprehended by your anointing. Your anointing abides in us if we are born again. We thank you that this is comprehensible. Even though it's a mystery and it's impossible for man, that you have made it possible that we can understand. May we not be filled with knowledge which puffs up, but help us edify in love. Because knowledge does puff up, but your love edifies. So as we increase in our knowledge, may we also increase in our humility. As we increase in our knowledge, may we also increase in our love. 
and scale our knowledge in retrospect to our humility and love so that we may bear good fruits which will glorify you. Give us a love for your word, to read it diligently, to know it more than our culture, to know your word more than we know about sport events, about celebrities, about the passing things of this world, that we love not this world or the things in it, that we set our affections on things above, not on things of this earth, that we will bind the loins of our mind, that we may truly understand your scriptures to apply them correctly. We thank you for the cross. We thank you for your blood that was shed on our behalf that we can be eternally secure, that we can, be, we can have assurance and know that we will be with you as we lean not on our own understanding, but we lean on your work on the cross on our behalf. And we thank you for your resurrection, which is a demonstration of your power and a, a triumph, which again secures our understanding and assurance in, in your work on the cross as believers. Help us be patient and wait for you, wait for your return, or to wait until you take us and let us labor well whilst we're here. Not looking back, that we grab the plow with our two hands and we push diligently and fervently for your kingdom's sake. Amen.